blessing as promised by the Lord. Someone will then rejoice and happy be. Someone will be heartbroken and crying mournfully. Maybe it's you.
Read something from uh, Turning Point. It's Dr. David Jeremiah's devotion that I read every morning. And this, this I think, October 6th. What was that, Wednesday? Checking in with my calendar wife. Wednesday? It was Wednesday, maybe, Thursday. Anyway, it was earlier this week. And it's, I said, man, you know, that's, that's pretty pertinent to what, uh, what's going on in, in, my, in my life and probably in most people's lives because everybody has decisions to make on a regular basis. Some are easy, some are not so easy. And the, the title of it was 2020 and it was I Will Guide You With My Eye and it's from Psalm 32, 8. And I'm going to read that. It's a Psalm of David. It says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impugn iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I will keep silent, my bones will grow old through my groaning all the day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. 
My vitality was turned into drought of summer. Selah, I ignored, acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from my trouble. You shall surround me with songs and deliverance. I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which may be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy will surround him. So, you know, I think the first part when David's talking about his, the Lord's hand was heavy upon him, I believe he's referring in that instance to uh, his sin against Bathsheba, and he was really bummed out and down and depressed until he confessed his sins. But, you know, if, if we follow the Lord, he'll give us good instruction. I'm reading here from uh, the devotion. It said, earlier this year, Ashley Winter, 37, of Hereford, England, set a new Guinness World of Record after running a mile in 10 minutes and 11 seconds while he was blindfolded. Perhaps you're wondering why anyone would run blindfolded. It was for a good cause. Winters suffered from keratonitis. Keratin yeah, he had an eye problem. And vision impairing eye disease. And he was raising money for a foundation that supports medical breakthroughs in ophthalmology. Pity those who run the race of this life blindfolded. What if there was no divine plan for your life? What if every step was a gamble and every mile a riddle? What if our entire journey was without God's guidance? Thankfully, there is a divine plan for us. God knows the orders and the arrangements for every day. He knows tomorrow as well as he knows yesterday. And he invites us to ask him for guidance at every point. He guides us with his eye so that our own eyes can see the way. If you're at a juncture or facing some hard decisions today, claim the promise of Psalm 32, 8. He will guide you with his eye. And there's a quote from a preacher named Alexander McLaren. It says, the first condition of securing real guidance in our daily life is to ask for it. The next is to look for it. And the third is the most difficult part, is be willing to accept it. Amen. Sometimes we get down in prayer, man. The Lord tells us what he wants us to do, and we just have a hard time getting with it. And Because uh, he will tell you, just like he'll tell you what's wrong in your life if you ask him. We don't always want to hear that. So, you know, we don't really want to know what's wrong with us, and sometimes we don't want to know how to fix it. But we don't want to be like the donkey or the horse with no understanding. Think your horses have understanding, Diane? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess that's why you put a bridle on them so you can turn them where you want them. All right. All right, well, let's have a prayer. Dear God, man, we just praise you for having a plan for us. We know your plan is good. We know your plan's right. It's not to say that the plan may not have some pain in it, but when we encounter those things, we need to look to you, we need to listen to you, and we need to accept your word and your voice is what is true and good for us, whether we like it or not. Be with us as we uh, study your word today so we can go on and make wise decisions in life, decisions that would be God-honoring to you. All these things we ask and pray for in the very strong and precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for Jesus and 
saving my soul Forgive me, I don't even know how I ought to pray And Lord, you know there are things I think I should say This place where it all began. So, Father, I praise you. Father, I worship you. Thank you for Jesus and saving my soul. I'm the prodigal son that you ran out and covered my shame. I'm the leper you healed. I've come back to lift up your name. Just like Morning, everybody. How are y'all? If if y'all if y'all didn't show up for breakfast today, you missed a belly full, and there was uh, some really fabulous people there this morning. People that you just wouldn't 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 miss being hanging around, like our chef Robert and Clifton, two of the coolest cooks I know. They they did a good job. I, I think Larry's been relieved of eggs. I haven't seen you cook eggs in several. Do you, Oh, okay. So anyway, it was it was a good time, man. Come out. It's uh, it's always the first Saturday of the month is the men's breakfast, and the second Sunday of the month is the uh, church breakfast. And all are welcome. It is a it is a great time. So our announcements for the morning. Let's see. We're continuing on in the Zechariah Bible study, and we are we did eleven today, or and we'll be doing 12 next week. It's just, it's a great bit of prophecy. If you like prophecy, it is really wonderful, and it just brings an understanding that I, I wouldn't get. Some of, some of it's pretty clear, but the details, this guy does a great job. Let's see, UMC Charge Conference is on a Thursday night, October 22nd, 2020, from 6 p.m. Jeff Warwick's going to be uh, the presiding elder. Jeff is a really great guy if you haven't met him. I encourage you all to come out for this. Uh, you know, sometimes we see like four or five people there, and it's kind of sad. You know, <laughs> maybe I ought to give the give, give Jeff a little respect and a little concern for the church would be really a good thing to do. Today, there's an administrative board meeting after the church. I think we should meet down in the big. We're going to meet down in the uh, 
fellowship hall, and that way you, you can eat bacon. There's a little bit more room trying to be uh, trying to be thoughtful about the whole COVID thing. And let's see. And then next Sunday, following church, we are going to have a general meeting of the church to uh, consider a vote on our departure from the UMC. And it's. I, I think we I think we need to call it a church conference just to be really with it. So it's a, a church general conference, and it will be following service next Sunday, Sunday the the 18th. Thank you very much. Yay! All right, let me get a calendar and just lay it out up here, and it probably wouldn't help me. All right. Okay, any announcements that are not in our virtual bulletin this morning? I've missed out on Thanksgiving's coming up November the 26th. Advent begins November the 29th. We did make a contribution to uh, the Compassion Center in Little Rock for uh, part of our 200,000 reasons and part of our just ongoing caring for the people who take a beating in life, man. And some of these people are really taking a beating in life. I posted on our church page, if any of y'all read that, where as part of their 200,000 reasons, no, it's part of the in-gathering, they have a literacy campaign. And I got a bucket, and I made it with a sign on it and everything, and it's still sitting where I left it on Thursday. I'm going to bring I'm gonna bring it in, and if anybody has old children's books, you know, that are edifying for kids or entertaining or whatnot, Bring them in and donate them if you're trying to clear out some bookshelves and you know you got. I know sometimes moms like to hold on to things because they think they're cute and they remind them of their kids. But you know what? Sometimes it's just time for stuff to go. So if you've got some children's books you want to donate, bring them in. I'll put a bucket out there in the foyer and we'll give them to the uh, literacy campaign for the in gathering. If there's nothing else, let's sing in some birthdays. If there's some birthdays. One somewhere. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. If y'all would take your highway hymnals and turn to page 258. Good morning. Good morning. I, don't, I don't know if anybody's going to do the testimony today. Anybody up for that? Okay. And I don't really have time because we've got a couple things we need to talk about today, so I'm going to 
kind of, I guess just real quick before we get into, because I don't want to get in the middle of worship and talk about this. Um, what Ken mentioned in the meeting, we need to get as many people here next week as possible because I don't want anybody to be left out of a decision so important as what the church is going to do going forward. Uh, and I hate that we got visitors today and we're talking about politics and church and religion and all that kind of stuff. But the um, <clears throat> the but anyway, uh, there are there is a way to leave. Uh, but unfortunately, no matter what, we are under the uh, they're under. We're under their, I guess they get to meter what, what is dealt to us. In other words, we have no say in what that looks like. And if you make them mad enough and you do it the wrong way, they fire the pastor and they put a padlock on the door and you lose your property. I'm giving you the extreme. If they like you and they uh, want to work with you, then... The least of things we've heard is the uh, paying of apportionments for another year, which we are good with that. That's great. But, it, but there's this, also, what is the church worth in the sense of, uh, is it in a growing area of town and these kind of things? And so they have an, a third, I guess you'd say, point of view. Uh, and so I'm just warning you that I have no control over any of that. And so, you know, you could go along to get along and keep your property and keep worshiping and ignore what they are doing. Or you could do something else. I'm just, and, and, I, and I guess I'll just close with this one thought. I didn't really want to do this today, but I want you to have an understanding of how important it is that people are at church next week to at least talk about it. Um, and, and I guess Christianity that doesn't cost anything isn't worth anything. And I'm just going to say it like that. So just be aware of what is possible. This is a place you guys love and know your whole lives. So just uh, think on that. It's a lot to be consider. I, I know. but I, Now, there is a way to leave. Um, and we have to approach it that way. It's called uh, exigent, cir exigent circumstances. So basically, they, they let us down in... And this is why we're leaving, okay? So that, that's, and so that, I hate to bring up such a downer thing to begin in church, but I sure didn't want to do it in the middle of a sermon. That'd be awful. But, uh, but I just wanted you to understand what's going on and, 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 and what the consequences could be. So I'm going to try to stay out of it as much as possible and let it, because it is your church. I don't need to be angering them personally. Uh, yeah, we, just, we just need to play nice and we have played nice all the way up so that's uh, speak the truth in love and have a whole lot of tact I mentioned that last week I don't have enough tact <laughs> I need some more tact but anyway uh, let's go to our praises I know that wasn't a praise but do we have any praises this morning yes 83 yay yeah. I, well, it's nine less. I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday, Barbara. Anybody else uh, got anything praiseworthy today? We got some visitors. Thank y'all for coming. Yes? Amen. I mean, good deal. All right. Um, I'm, I'm happy y'all are here. I mean, I, you know, this is where we're supposed to be on Sunday morning, praising God. Regardless of all the stuff going on in the world, we're supposed to be walking outside of all that stuff. So I'm so glad y'all are here. Um, prayer concerns? We probably got plenty. Anybody got a... The, the, the boys I keep talking about up in Pleasant Plains, miraculously that one, that one boy is still uh, hanging on and I, I, I it didn't look good and he's still he's still making some progress but he's in a horrible place but the other the other people in the accident seem to be doing you know pretty good so let's just keep keep that in our prayers we're having some fundraisers and stuff for him Okay, okay. Like like you? Okay, okay, okay. 
Okay, I got you. Good deal. Good deal. Anybody else this morning? Saturday I was driving home from Tennessee and I saw several bad wrecks. Two of them were truck drivers that rolled their trucks and we had to pray for them and their families and uh, other people that were involved in the I just really want to pray for Randy Crouch because he's one of the good guys for the DOT and uh, he's, he's the guy that comes to your rescue or something. Amen. All right. We got yes. Amen. If if you would like, we're doing another one of our prayer vigils in BB for the country, and it's going to be on October thirty first, the Saturday morning at ten o'clock. Uh, and we had a pretty good turnout the first one. I got a feeling this one's going to be several hundred people because we didn't have much warning. But if you'd like to come and join us, uh, it's like three days before the election, and I think it's important. It's important that just people show up and stand up and people know that their Christians are out there praying for our country. It's, I mean, if no other reason, just the fact that they see us do that, that we care, and that, that's important. So we'll be doing that again, and I'm, I'm excited to have a bigger turnout than last time, but it was amazing for a short time. Uh, anybody and, and I was kind of hoping that other cities like Cabot and other cities would would kind of step up and do something similar. But you know, we're it's it's hard to spread things around like that. Other uh, anybody else? All right. Well, then let's go to the Lord in, in prayer. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and you know we remember that you're in charge, and that, and I think we struggle with that. You know, we worry about the election, we worry about COVID, we worry about a lot of things, but Lord, you are sovereign, and you walk with us, and you watch over us, and if we just remember that, we can walk in these days with our heads held high, and, and with our only pride, not being of ourselves, but our proud of who we are in, in you, Lord. Lord, we lift up all the names on the prayer list, and we, and we have quite a few. We lift up those that are here, those that can't be here. We lift up those that have been in the hospital. We lift up that family up in Pleasant Plains with all those family members. Lord, we lift up just our schools. We lift up the, the, the family of the person who died recently for Cabot. Lord, we just lift up a lot of folks that really need to see your presence and your peace and your joy right now. We, we struggle. We struggle in these days, but you said that there'll be a day when he will return. And Lord, I, and, and we know that you're with us. You know we, we have your peace. And Lord, we just ask you right now to, to bless everyone in the sound of my voice. And, and Lord, just give them, the, to let them hear the Holy Spirit speaking to them today. We need to hear your Holy Spirit today. We need some guidance. We need some wisdom. And most of all, we need the hope that comes from Jesus Christ. And Lord, just be with us through the service and help us to be who we are here and in the world, Lord. And just who you call us to be always. And now I let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's turn to page number 205. We'll sing all three verses and stand on the last, please.
let's all stand, please. When I meet the ransom over on the golden shore, I'll be satisfied. There to join the angels singing praises evermore, I'll be satisfied. I'll be satisfied. I'll be satisfied. When my soul is resting in the presence of the Lord, Would you join us in, as we begin worship? good at this one by now. Oh, that was good. That was a hallelujah from the little one. <laughs> All right, join me, guys. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. For, for the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of righteousness, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Please be seated. All right. I, I kind of overloaded myself, and I did that last week, and y'all can just shoot me. I didn't bring any technology this week, so we're good. Um, like my title, Humpty Dumpty and the Jumbo Shrimp. There's, that's the simplest way I can explain something that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, and we'll talk about the Humpty Dumpty and Jumbo Shrimp later. Um, those are the scriptures. We're not going to go to Isaiah 6 because in the interest of time. Uh, but let's just say that that's where the reference is in Isaiah. <clears throat> We're going to talk about something that probably everyone in the Western world knows about or knows of. When I tell you or ask you if you know what a good Samaritan is, you know what that is, right? And that's all because of Jesus in this, in this, uh, in this Luke chapter 10, sharing that story. It's probably one of the most uh, preached on and preached in a million different ways of any story that I've ever come across in the Bible. But I want, I want to do something this morning I've never done before. I'm going to give you the simple version, the complex version, and the prophetic, and the prophetic version. If I run out of time, I'll just stop. I'm going to finish it next week. But... What I put up there earlier was Humpty Dumpty and the Jumbo Shrimp. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, right? All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. In the story of the, of the Good Samaritan, you have a man who goes down and he falls. And the highest people in the land, which would be the Pharisees, couldn't help him or wouldn't help him. 
And then, the, and, then the, and then behind that were the, the Pharisees, the Levites, but they were the workers of the church, and they couldn't help him either. So you have the same story as Humpty Dumpty. You had somebody who had a great fall, and these two groups of people who are in power, one at the highest level and one at the lower level, could not help him or would not help him. We'll say it like that. So why the jumbo shrimp? Because in Jesus' day, there was absolutely no such thing as a good Samaritan. A Samaritan was a bad person. He was the absolute epitome of evil. So when Jesus says a good Samaritan, he has got them reeling already. And so we're going to start right there and go to our, go to our scripture. Um, I'm going to start with, the, like I say, the simple version. And I've heard this one the most uh, in my life and taught it the most to people. And we're going to kind of drill down on just a little bit of the story. And then we're going to back out a little further and get more context. And then we're going to back way out and look at prophecy. But if you look at uh, Luke chapter 10, and let's just drill down, and let's get all the way down to where Jesus is telling the actual parable. And he starts in verse 30. And he says, A certain man went down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounding him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side, Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came there where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend... When I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And you know the answer. Which one was it? The Good Samaritan, right? Okay. And on the surface, it looks like a story of how we should help those who have fallen in need. I mean, that's, that's the basic. In every um, organization across the world, and, I'm, and it's a little bit general, but that does something like that, they'll use the Good Samaritan as an example as for, their, for their ministry, whatever it might be. And it can even be a secular ministry, they'll use it for that. It's also used to promote the idea of social justice being the most important thing that a church can do versus being those who are out discipling others to Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with social justice, but I would tell you it's not the job of the church. Because social justice is a little bit like socialism and communism and Marxism and all those. It's kind of a, a thing where if you'll take all the stuff from somebody and give it to somebody else by force, then you create a, a different world. And, I, and I'm not going to get into the politics of that, but what I would tell you is that if a person is saved and walking with the Lord, they are going to do those things. That's the part you've got to get. But that's not the whole, that's not even the point of the message. But if I go ahead and tell you the simplified version of this, the, the simplified version of this story is that the man in the ditch is us. Okay? That's the simplified version. And we have been put out of society and judged and looked upon and, and we've struggled and we've been beaten and we're falling apart. And Jesus is the Good Samaritan, and he came along, and he bound up our wounds, and he put us on his donkey, and he set us on the, on the road to recovery. That is the simplified, modern, contemporary, Christian version of the story. The problem is, you can never call Jesus a Samaritan because he was 100% Jewish. The reason why the people hated the Samaritans so much was because they intermarried with Gentiles and they were half-breeds and they were hated and so there was this, it's almost like I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana and there were two powerhouse schools and one was Woodlawn High School and uh, Terry Bradshaw played there, one of those guys you've never heard of and, and uh, you know, who else? Uh, I can't think of the guy before him. Huh? No, 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 it was another guy, another man. I was trying to think of it was before him, and I'm losing it. Uh, 
He never won a Super Bowl. He's one of the best quarterbacks of all time. I can't think. Anyway, he was he was before Terry. And then the school spun out of that, which I went to called Southwood High School. And anytime you take a school and you split it in half and you have two, man, that is, that is like the ultimate rival. I mean, it becomes because they came out of the other. Well, that's exactly what happened. The Samaritans, you know, they went on the wrong side of things by, by intermarrying and worshiping idols and all that. But at some point, they kind of got their act together and they, and they became a, a different version of Judaism. And they, and they hate each other because they didn't believe their temple. They believed they had the first temple. They had the first place that was ever. And all of this, it was a big battle. And, and, and like I said, they were absolutely hated each other because they just, just the way they thought about each other. And they were, and, and they, the Jews looked at the Samaritans as second class citizens. And, the, and that's kind of important that we understand all this for the story. And then the other way around was uh, the Samaritans thought the Jews thought they were better than everybody. Okay? Pretty, pretty simple story. I got, you, I got you through the simple version. The simple version is that we're the man in the ditch. And, 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 and I guess the thing you would say is that the pastor of the church, I'll pick on the people here in the church for a minute. The pastor of the church was the first guy that went down. And he didn't stop. He was real busy. He had to get home. He didn't stop and help that guy. And then the, the second guy that came were the workers of the church, the, the deacons, the people on the board, those people. They came by and saw him in the ditch, and they didn't do anything. And they walked by, and then somebody who just had a good heart stopped and helped the guy. That's kind of like I say, that's kind of the encapsulating whole story of, what, of, the, of, the, of the way you would do it, the way people I've heard do it. Now, the problem is Jesus Christ doesn't give straight answers sometimes. As a matter of fact, he uses questions to create situations where people show their heart. And so let's back up just a little bit. And, and before we get into that too much, I want to go over to Matthew chapter 13 because it's going to be important that we understand the rest of it. But um, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus begins to speak in parables for the first time. And, and from that day, it says that, that from that day forward that he, that he spoke in parables. But if you um, look down to verse 10, it says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him more will be given, and who has abundance, whoever does not have, even him will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. Hearing you will see, hear, hear, I'm sorry, hearing you will hear and you shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I shouldn't heal them. And I'm going to stop right there. Um, but, but it's really interesting. But when we get back to the prophetic part of it, when I, talk to, when I get to the very end, look at, um, while we're there, since we're there, Matthew 13 in verses 34. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable, he did not speak to them. You realize he got to a point in his ministry, a year, about a year before he was executed, that he started only speaking in parables? And he just, he said, on that day, he decided I'm going to speak in parables from henceforth. So when he was talking to somebody and had a question or was trying to make a teaching, he spoke in parables. Parables are about two things. They're, they're always a salvation story, but they're also judgment for the person who does not understand them. You got me? And the minute he started preach, teaching in parables, every time he would say one, they got angry. The people on the other side got angrier and angrier because he was condemning them. He was making them look at their own lives and how they lived. So there's a lot to this parable thing that I want you to understand. But, let's just, but here's what the rest of this is right here. It says, He did not speak to them that if they might be filled what was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, and I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Do you understand that when Jesus spoke in parables, 
he spoke about things that have been kept secret from the foundation of the world, which means including the end times and everything going forward. He, the, the parables and even everything that Jesus said, to my opinion, it spoke to something that, and in the prophets as well, it spoke to something that maybe happened in the past. It spoke to something that happened in the here and now for them that day. And it spoke to something in the future as well. So it, it, it's hard for us because Jesus is God and he can, he can do stuff like that. He can make one set of words, a handful of verses, mean something so profound. And people say the Bible is boring. People say the Bible doesn't mean anything. How could you get that? And the reason people can't get it is the very reason he said they will listen and not hear and see and not understand. Because if you are walking and you're one of his, you will read this stuff and it will mean more to you than anybody else. And in our story, which we're about to get to, this is the complex version of the story, we're going to hear him talking to basically a Pharisee. They call him a lawyer, but he was someone who knew the Mosaic law. He was basically Jesus. He was a rabbinic. He would be the rabbi that came to, to teach. I mean, he's the teacher, the guy that is going to stand up and ask the question. But uh, before I, I go there, I want you to just think about a couple of stories that you already know uh, where this comes up. Because it comes up three times I know of for sure in Scripture. There are no parables in John. And the only thing we can reach in in John to look at is Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to him and he says, What must I do to be saved or have eternal life? I forgot how it's worded. And he says, You must be born again. And he puts him through that whole thing. And we have John 3.16 that comes out of that. Okay, so the Pharisees are all testing him. Now, I would say Nicodemus was the only one that came to him with a legitimate uh, concern. In other words, it, he really wanted to know. He had seen Jesus make miracles. He, he really, really was a good guy. And, and, and he really wanted to take to heart what Jesus said. But everybody else I'm about to mention, that was not the point. The point was to catch Jesus in something so they could quickly get him executed and get him out of their life. Okay? But Jesus is smarter than that. So um, go ahead and flip side, slides. This is kind of important, Annalie. Next slide. Just put that one up. Anyone who really wants the truth ends up at Jesus. If you don't get anything else out of what I say today, that's the, actually the message. It's the message that, the, that these guys could not get. They could not, they could not get that message. So let's get, go to our story, and let's go to the real longer version of the story. And it, and it starts off in verse 25. And, and I could go back prior to that um, and, and talk about you know, there's the 70 that went out and then they returned with joy because they did all these miraculous things. And then it moves down. And, and actually in verse 23, right above where we're going to start, some more of this Isaiah stuff. Blessed are, those, blessed are the eyes which see things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. So all of time people have been wanting to see Jesus. Now, if you were wanting to know about eternal life, could you think of anybody better to tell you what that looks like than Jesus Christ? I mean, if you're going to go to the feet of Jesus, like that says, you know, if you're going to be the one there, he's the one to ask, right? I mean, that makes total sense. And so he says, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. Let's stop right there. What they mean that, that makes this kind of unusual if you, I know a lot of you haven't been to Israel, but some of you have. Did y'all ever see how they preach? How the, how the Jewish people preach? Did you, ever get to, did you ever go somewhere with that? You notice that? They sit in a chair behind a pulpit, and their head is kind of like this. You know, and this is their position when they preach. So that's what Jesus was doing. And if you had a student that wanted to learn something, they would stand up and kind of give you, I guess you'd say, give you your reverence, and they would ask you a question. The problem is, this guy in this story, and I'm, I'm trying to put it in modern terms as best I can, he's trying to be a hot shot. He knows everything. So he's going to stand up and act like he's submitting to Jesus' teachings. But in reality, that is not why he's there. He's standing up to, to, to try to throw a curve at him, which they've been trying all along. And so, he, so here's what he says. He says, teacher, 
What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? Okay, so he knew where his heart was. He knew, he knew who he was talking to. Jesus always preached to his audience. He always knew how to talk to them. Hopefully that's something I will learn how to do someday, <laughs> to learn how to preach and select sermons from my audience and get it right every time. But he, he, he was a master at it. And he, said, he said to him, what is written in the law and what is your reading of it? And he, so he answered and said, because this guy has been to church more than a little bit. He is the guy who teaches. I would say he's one of the highest people in, because they wouldn't send somebody forward to challenge Jesus that wasn't the absolute most knowledgeable. Do you understand? If you're going to challenge somebody, you send the A-team. So send this guy in there to, to, to question Jesus. And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And that's, I think that's Deuteronomy, uh, I'm trying to remember, 5, 11, I don't know. In Leviticus 19, 18, I'm, I'm trying to remember. But those two put together. So, I mean, that's a, something that Jesus says more than once, and it's actually said more than once in the Old Testament. And then Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly to do this, and you shall live. Or will live. So, what about the cross? And what about Jesus? And what about the gospel message? Why would he tell that man, if you do this, you'll have eternal life? Because he knew what was coming. He's God. He knows what he's about to do in less than a year. He understands. So, so why, why is he answering this guy this way? Well, he's a strategist, the best that ever walked the earth. And he's, he's, he's making him comfortable in his pride. He's making him comfortable that he knows the answer. You got me? He makes him comfortable that he figured it out. And so he, he's, he's, he's got it. He's, you know, I know all this. I'm a great teacher. There ain't nothing he can do to surprise me. And so he lets him have, he throws him a bone. He throws him something that he knows. And so he gets up there and he tells him, the problem is, can anybody here live into what he just said? Love your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. 100% every day, day in, day out, and never fail. Seriously, you can't do it. But Jesus went ahead and went this direction. And so, so you have to understand that a parable is a story. It didn't happen it's not real. These are people that Jesus picked to make a point to show this Pharisee his pride, his personal pride in his own belief that he is better than everybody else and he has got it figured out. Now, the two other stories I mentioned were Nicodemus, which he was not that case, but if you remember the story of the rich young ruler, he came and they basically ask a different question, which is the greatest of these commandments, and had the same answer. But the difference is, the thing that had him all hung up was, he was rich. And that's all he really cared about. And basically Jesus told him, get rid of that and you'll be fine. So what I would tell you is, is these people are coming to Jesus with their answer already figured out, and not coming to Jesus being available to what he says is the answer. There's a difference. There's a humble way to get there. So, here, here's, let's continue our story. And I guess uh, I was going to wait and do this on the prophetic part, but let's just, I'll give you a little bit of data. Okay, so if you've been to Israel or not, Jerusalem is God's place on planet Earth. He pointed it out. He picked it out. He he, he chose it. It's been the place before all time and all the great important events will happen there and going to happen still. The story travels from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's about 17 miles. And it is 17 miles like this with steep, steep cliffs and it's hard to travel and it drops nearly 4,000 feet in 17 miles. And, it, and just to kind of give you some revelation stuff, that is where when the when when Jesus returns and the water flows out of the mountain, it's going to go down that same trail right into the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea will come back to life. I mean, that's a bunch of other stuff. We can get into all that, but just some interesting things because I've seen that. I've got, got great pictures of it, and it's just amazing how <laughs> steep and dangerous it is. But it, it is one of those kind of roads. 
you know, uh, it makes the Arkansas Pig Trail look like a joke, but I'm just by comparison. But it's different. It's more of a canyon situation than what we're used to. Anyway, so I want you to kind of understand what's going on. And, and the other side of that is, uh, think about Jesus' life. His entire life, he was working toward Jerusalem. Got me? The, in the story, the, the person is going away from Jerusalem, but in, in, in cro the cross of Christ and his death happened in Jerusalem. So his whole life, he's working his way the other way, from the bottom, from the pit, all the way to the top, to, be, to, to claim victory for all of us. But anyway, let's get back to the story. He said, um, teacher, what shall I do to inherit earth and inherit eternal life? And he said, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered, you shall love your God and so forth. And then Jesus tells him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you shall live. Well, of course, when he told him, do this and you shall live, that's impossible, right? We've, we've determined that's impossible. So, but he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So, he doesn't really want to sacrifice anything. What he's asking Jesus is, is how high is the bar? You got me? How much good am I going to have to do to get to heaven? You have to understand that's a works-based religion. How much good do I have to do to get to heaven? And of course, then Jesus answers with a story. He doesn't answer the question. He answers with a story. And he says... A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounding him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest, and I hear a great pause right here because he's going, yeah, the priest is going to stop and help this. This guy's a priest. He's thinking, Jesus tell this story so that, hey, he's going to stop and help. I'm good. I'm righteous. I'm in. See, I answered rightly. I got all this. I'm, 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 I'm saved. I have eternal life. I have all these things. He, he's, this story is for the benefit of the man who doesn't see his own self-pride. He says, by a chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side, and the guy went, oh. He's going, man, that wasn't, that wasn't what I wanted to hear, that I wouldn't have stopped and helped him. So let, let's give the priest a little bit of... of uh, I guess you'd say, uh, I don't know, the word would be excuse, uh, why he wouldn't have done that. They used to go, they would go up and serve their two weeks in Jerusalem. And most likely, you know, he was returning home after two weeks. It's like working a lot of shifts at the hospital or something. And you've got to go home after that. And on the way home, you see this guy in trouble and you're tired. And you, there's no cell phones in this day and you can't call your wife and tell her you're going to be late. Because if you stop and touch him and he makes you unclean, guess what? You've got to go back to the temple and get all cleaned up again. So it's kind of problematic and bothersome for him, bothersome for him to go do that. So I, I think that's an interesting, uh, uh, interesting thing to think about. One of the things I did not mention, and, I, and it just kind of hit me just then, the question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You notice that? Inherit, not earn eternal life. You got me? You cannot earn it. You have to inherit it. So that means there's nothing that you can do. There's nothing you can do about your inheritance except maybe be nice to your mom so she'll give it to you. I mean, but other than that, then your inheritance has nothing to do with, with, with you. It's something that you're going to get because, so I find that interesting. So now when you go, then we're going to start talking about the Levites here in a second. Like I said, the Levites were the workers. And the Levites, I think, are most famous, if I remember right, for when... Um, they came down off the mountain and the tablets and, and, and uh, Moses got so mad and, and then uh, they executed all the people. The Levites were the workers of the church. They were also the policers of the church. They would be like Ken right now protecting our church. They were also the ones that served and lit the candles and did all those things. So they were the, the workers and the doers of the church. So here comes, here's the law. You're listening to this and you think, wow, okay, the Levites are the workers. They'll go help this guy. So, so likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. And guess what? He's, his, his mind's, oh man, we've, we've missed. He's talking about me. He's talking about my church. He's talking about my religion. He's talking about how I believe. He's talking about what my faith is in. And then it says, but a certain Samaritan. 
a Samaritan, the absolute enemy, the person that they wouldn't, I mean, literally wouldn't have anything to do with, would actually go to battle with, would, I mean, it's just an awful relationship between the two. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, had, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, which they would have carried with them because they're traveling, and that's how they cook their food and eat. And he set on him his own animal. So I told you that what the path is like. It's 4,000 feet like this of rocks and mesh. You need your animal to walk. You don't walk it. You, you need to be on something. And he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him whatever more you spend. When I come again, I will repay you. So, and of course we get back to the same question. What I would tell you is, this is the most lavish form of taking care of somebody. It's, it's, it's giving them your car. It's tearing the shirt off your back and bandaging their wounds. The two denarii, they think, would have been worth 60 days at the end. Now, it's not an end like me and you think. But it's like giving enough money to feed and take care of that guy for 60 days because his bones are probably broken. He's probably in bad shape. He's going to be there for a long time. So, and then he, he even says, when I come back in two days, I'll pay you. Now, it's kind of interesting. One of the conversations about this is that the innkeepers were scoundrels. So the fact that he said, oh, you have an open account, I'll sign for whatever when I get back, means that he didn't care what it cost, just take care of the guy. Now, there's a message in that for us. That it doesn't, you know, there's this, this lavish kind of love for another. But I'm telling you again, this is to tell the lawyer that he, that he ain't all that. This is to tell him that this is what someone who loves God with all his heart and all his soul and all his mind and his neighbor as himself looks like. Now, the, the Pharisees, they had uh, a couple of scriptures that they could go to, and one of them basically gave the impression that they could hate others who did not believe. And really, we understand it as hating the sin and not the sinner. I mean, that's kind of our modern interpretation. But they actually took it to the point that they could go to a certain scripture and use that to say, well, I don't have to love those people. I can hate them. But God told them another place in the Old Testament to love the stranger. So they knew full well who the neighbor was, what God expected, and so forth. So I just, I need you to understand that the story is not a real story. It's just a, an example of how people who come to Jesus and don't want to give in and let him be the Lord of their life miss the point. These people were so self-righteous and so full of what they knew that they, th they thought it was impossible. They, I mean, he really thought he knew more than Jesus Christ. Of course, he didn't know. He didn't consider him the Messiah, and I kind of get that. But this was a condemning judgment of that man by Jesus Christ. That's what it was. It was also a salvation story for who, what is required of us to be saved. It's both. And all of the stories have that. Now, I got time. We're going to get to the one about the prophecy part of it. Um, but we just need to understand it's an attitude of self-righteousness that Jesus was trying to point out. He did the same thing to the rich young ruler, and in some ways he even did that to Nicodemus. The difference being, Nicodemus was receptive. You get me? He came there for the right reasons. Now, but after this story, you come to the story of Mary and Martha. And y'all remember Mary and Martha. Women, boy, they jump in on Mary and Martha. They know, and they all, got, they all know which one they are, too. <laughs> And so, and it's kind of funny to hear that, but what, what is the important point of Mary and Martha, at least from Jesus' lips? Basically, that the one who places themselves at the feet of Jesus, instead of worrying about the dishes, has got the better lot and the better goal. The work has to be done. He's not discounting the work. He's just saying, you got to come to the feet of Jesus because that's what really matters. And that's why I put that, that verse, I mean that verse, but that saying up there. So now, let's, so do you understand that the whole story was to make a point with the lawyer? And every Hebrew that ever read this, every Jewish person, every, every person that, that finds himself, you know, what about the, uh, 
the story of the, what is it, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Oh, I'm so glad I'm not like that tax collector. Same thing. He did not understand what God had designed, who, what loving your neighbor, or even loving God was like. Because if you really love God like this, you're going to take care of your neighbor. Now, one, one of the things about that story that I find interesting, uh, it's kind of a nondescript man that goes into the ditch. And I would tell you, that tells us that all lives matter, right? That person in the ditch needed help. It doesn't matter. We don't know much about the man. We just know that the man is beaten down and he's there. And, and, and so we have to understand, even from the very first example I gave you, even if that's not Jesus that took care of the man, it is the church that's supposed to take care of the man. That, that's the part that we need to understand. So now, let's go to the prophetic version of it. In the Bible, Jerusalem is a place of victory, right? Jericho is a place of defeat. And it says a certain man traveled down. And I would submit to you that the prophetic version of this is that certain man was Adam. And Adam traveled from a place of victory. And along the way, he met a politician. And he couldn't help him. And then he met religion. And it couldn't help him. And finally, when he got there and he was beaten and broken and battered, a Christian came up and took him out of that mess. You see, I don't believe politics or religion can fix this world. I just don't. See, Pharisees were political leaders as much as they were. And I think that's why there's a delineation between the ones in charge, because it was a political office, and the ones who worked, because they put their faith and their trust 100% in politics and religion. But the man didn't need politics and religion in the ditch, did he? The man needed Jesus Christ-filled people to take him out of that ditch and love on him. So Adam has all of our sins, and I find it most interesting, the Samaritan was half-Jewish, and also half dead, by the way, but half Jewish and half Gentile. Christians are Gentiles with a Jewish spirit in them. You got me? So Adam is portrayed as this, as this uh, Samaritan. And then also, he was half dead. What part of Adam's life did he lose in the garden? Not his physical life. He lost his eternal life. So he was half Jewish, had the spirit of a Jew in him. He was a Gentile. And he had half, he had lost half of his life, half dead. He lost eternal life. So I do believe that that is the message of, of the, that that's the prophetic version of the message. And I believe everything that Jesus said can be broken down in some way. And is that correct? I'll let you pick which one of the three you want to believe. I think for the straight up version, it's the middle one. But there's nothing wrong with us understanding that we need to reach down and help others, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But just remember that the story was about making someone understand that they have to come to the feet of Jesus and give up on any self-righteous view of the world and themselves to come to Christ. That's the, part, that's the point of the story. It's not whether or not somebody did good or bad for somebody. It is a barbed thing that Jesus did. He was very sarcastic. And as a matter of fact, me and Tina talked about that for a church. God is so sarcastic sometimes. When Moses said, I cannot speak, and he said, who made your mouth? It's an example. God is sarcastic, and he is, he is poking this guy. This guy thinks he has it all figured out. And what I don't want you to become is a bunch of people who... I think they have it all figured out. You can't live like that. We have to submit to who he is. 
We have to take him at face value. We have to take the Bible at face value. We have to live into what he calls us to be. But, but you also have to understand that takes humility. It takes submission. It takes obedience. So, so that the story, yes, it's pointed at a Pharisee. We got plenty of modern day Pharisees walking around right now today. Because they place too much emphasis on the things that God did not say. I mean, and I would say that's part of the reason we're into this little debacle with the Methodist church is there are things that God never counted in Scripture or lined out that way, and yet because a man who thinks he knows more than God chose to have a belief that is counter to the Bible, that is that self-righteous spirit, and it is dangerous. And I would tell you that it has ruined many a church. And it, it even comes down to a pastor there can be a pastor put in a place and start teaching things that are way outside the Bible. And it's because he's so full of himself. And I see mega pastor, church pastors all the time have great followings. And I watch what they say and I go like, what perversion of the Bible did you get? You know, where did you find that? So my, my thing for you this morning is to understand Jesus did this because he was judging those people. And every time he did it, it got worse and they got madder. And he's making fun of them. He's poking at them in a very holy way. I'll say it like that. In a Jesus way. But, you know, he, he, he got to them. And every time he told a parable, he made them matter and matter and matter. Because he could see through their false love of God. He could see their hearts. Don't let your heart be like that. That's all I'm saying. Amen. Let's pray. So, we, Father, we thank you for your word this morning, and we thank you for the fact that it is not one simple one-and-done kind of word. It's like an onion. You peel back layers, and there's so much there. And you allow us, probably more so than all the times in history before now, to see things we couldn't see before if we would just study your word. You said that you'll make revelations to us in the end times of what you've written, the mysteries that are kept hidden. All of those things are, gonna, are possible for the, just the average person to be able to read because it just takes studying word. Don't have to be a, a theologian or anything, Lord. Just help us to, to understand what you want to tell us through your word. Help us to live into that and not to be full of ourselves so that we, that we just don't understand that, you know, we're just people. And that's who he called. You know, he didn't call theologians. He called fishermen and tax collectors and, and just everyday working people to, to be a part of his kingdom because he saw their hearts. Lord, help us to have a heart for God. I ask you this morning if there's anyone here that doesn't know you or doesn't, hasn't been following you as he should, Lord, would you work on them this morning? Help them to find a way to come to an understanding of who you want them to be and how they should live, Lord. No more important decision can a person make than to walk with the Lord. And I just ask you, Lord, to bless this church. And as we leave here today, help us to walk with the Lord in everything that we do. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Let's all stand and turn to page 202.
I, uh, I find it interesting. It, it, it really kind of struck me that Jesus would actually answer a question with a question. And, and it, it made me think about when you talk to somebody and they don't know, uh, like I, one of the common ones preachers get is, do you really think God will send anyone to hell? And I would, my ask my, instead of answering that, I could say it with a question. I'd say, well, do you think there's anybody that deserves to go to hell? And of course, they will, like Hitler or something. That's what they would say. You know, that's how they would answer. By doing that, you get them into a conversation versus just taking your King James Bible out and beating them down with it and trying to tell them they need to live a certain way. So I just want you to think about that. It's really interesting. He, he knew what he was doing. He knew how to get to a person's heart. And, and until you like the Samaritan did, get down in the ditch with people and love on them and help them, they won't listen to your message. It's just the way it is. People break bread with them, help them, do whatever with them. They, they, you can't, they, they won't listen. They won't care how much you know till they know how much you care. It's pretty simple stuff. So tithes and offerings, I always forget. We got, we, we, do it so weird now with all the COVID things. So if you want to give to the church, we have a right there at the back door on the way out. Anyway, uh, I want to bless y'all this week. Y'all have a great week. And just remember, you know, we, we got a job to do. And, and, and please don't skip next week. I mean, I promise the, the sermon will be awful, but come anyway. So, and, uh, and y'all, uh, because we got important business and it, it matters. It really does matter. And uh, God bless y'all and have a wonderful week. Lord. Father and to the